ahead and welcome everyone to the World Affairs Council of Atlanta, a members forum event. I'm Ricky Bevington, president of the council. The council is a nonpartisan membership and grant supported organization and our mission is to provide a forum like this one for informed discussion of the global affairs that impact Metro Atlanta and support the city's transformation into an international economic hub. You can find more information on becoming a member of the council at our website, wacatlanta.org. That's W-A-C atlanta.org. Thank you so much for joining this evening's conversation with Maureen Denvor, Director of International Growth at MailChimp. I think this is a company that perfectly represents the mission of the council, which is international business and the city's growth into an international economic hub, and of course, the global affairs that impact business in Atlanta. Maureen will be interviewed by Amanda Mattingly, our wonderful chair of our Members Forum Steering Committee. Amanda, thank you so much for tonight's conversation. I am certainly looking forward to it. A housekeeping note for those of us who are joining us, if you want to ask a question, please type it into the Q&A function. Uh, I believe actually that that's correct. And as I'm saying it, I'm wondering if that is incorrect. So if one of my uh, graduate students can, can, can correct me if we need to, but typically we use the Q&A. If that's not an option, we can use the chat function. Uh, but I want to make sure that we pick one option for submitting questions so that Amanda isn't clicking between, uh, between screens. So Amanda, take it away. Thank you so much, Ricky. I appreciate that introduction and welcome everybody to, to tonight's February Members Forum um, at the World Affairs Council of Atlanta. We're so excited to have you all here tonight and um, to hear our featured speaker, Maureen Dembor, um, who is, as Ricky just noted, the Director of International Growth at MailChimp this Atlanta success story. And we're so excited to hear about MailChimp tonight. I know everybody's been dying to know the secret. So Maureen's here to tell us all about it. Um, so did you all know that MailChimp started in a, like a tiny little office on the west side of Atlanta? And so 20 years later, it sold for what, $12 billion? So what? Um, what was the strategy? Um, we're so excited to, to have Maureen here tonight to tell us a little bit about MailChimp's journey and the substantial global expansion project that they are now embarking on. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Maureen, who we're so lucky to have here tonight. Um, Maureen holds a master's degree in international business and uh, marketing. She's worked for the last 14 years building brands um, and growing them globally, including brands, you know, small brands like Coca-Cola, <laughs> very large brands. So um, she's got lots of great experience. She's worked and lived in France, the Netherlands, and of course here in the United States. So she's just an expert in cross-cultural business relations and brand marketing. And uh, we're just so grateful to have you here tonight with us, Maureen. So welcome. Um, I'm gonna get the conversation started, if that's okay, by asking you to just go ahead and tell us a little bit about MailChimp's story. I mean, there's just been tremendous growth in the last 20 years. And um, I wonder if Maureen, you'll set the stage for us and, and tell us a little bit about MailChimp. Of course, and uh, thank you so much for that very kind intro, Amanda. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. So thank you for, for having me. I've been looking forward to this. And let me dive in and tell you a little bit about MailChimp. Uh, MailChimp is an all-in-one marketing platform for growing businesses. So we empower millions of customers all around the world to launch, build, and grow their businesses using world-class world -class marketing technology award-winning customer support, and then inspiring inspiring content as well. Um, MailChimp's marketing platform allows our customers to get online and basically start selling. Uh, we allow them to connect with and grow their audience and then create multi-channel marketing campaigns across email, social media, landing pages, ads, websites, and more, all from, from one place. And I can tell you a little bit about our customers as well. 
our customers are small and medium sized businesses, particularly in the commerce and apps uh, spaces. So we have uh, a unique perspective and very deep respect for small and medium sized business owners. And our mission is to empower them, plain and simple. And now as part of Intuit, we strive to power prosperity for everyone. And in terms of our company culture and brand, uh, we, don't, we don't take ourselves too seriously and we try to inject fun into everything that we do. So our goal is for small businesses, customers to see how fun marketing can be. Yeah, thank you for that. I think that comes across definitely um, for those of us who use MailChimp, we, um, we definitely see that. So thanks. So talk about a little bit, if you would, Maureen, about the, um, the global expansion strategy that um, MailChimp has. And you know, what is the strategy now? How has it maybe changed since the acquisition, um, since it's now part of Intuit? We're curious about that. And how does your own, um, how has your own role sort of developed? What, what, um, what have you brought to the role from your past marketing experience at Coca-Cola, for example? Sure, I'm happy, yeah, happy to talk about that. First, maybe I should share some key stats about, about Nelchin that will help understand a little bit more about the global footprint. Sure, so that have, would be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought, I thought that might be. We have 13 million active customers um, around the world with about 14,000 new customers adding every day. Uh, in terms of our international business stats, um, we have over half of our revenue and our paying customers coming from outside of the US with on, our non-US revenue being at 53% and our non-US paid customers being at 52%. Uh, those customers span across over about 190 countries with some major markets being UK, Canada, Australia, France, Spain, and Brazil, but really their customers um, pretty much on every continent. And then we have a, a major service partner network. We have about over 11,000 total service partners. So those are freelancers, agencies, and developers that help their clients use MailChimp to grow. And about 60% of those are non-US in over 150 countries. Did you say 11,000? We wow. have, yes, yeah. Okay, and 190, 190 countries. Many countries. Yeah, And wow. so we've seen a tremendous amount of international growth that's happened, I would say organically, but you know, as I was preparing for this call, thinking, okay, how can I set this up and kind of talk about what are some of the factors that, that have led to this, to this growth. And I can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, please. What are some All of the right. factors? <laughs> Let's right. dive in. So, yes. Um, ton of growth internationally. So I think there are some factors that are inherent um, to, to MailChimp and to the platform that have helped us get here. Uh, first of all, SaaS software as a service tends to travel very well. Uh, another point is that the platform is very easy to use. So it's a powerful marketing tool for customers, but at the same time, um, I think the, the user experience is, is relatively, is very easy. And so that has made it easy for customers, no matter where they are to adopt it and grow. Another factor is email marketing. So for the first 16 years in business, MailChimp developed and mastered the art of email marketing. So uh, it's one of the most, it just tends to be one of the most cost-effective ways to communicate with your audience and uh, customers get to see a lot of return from that. So I think the fact that email marketing was MailChimp strength and has been MailChimp strength for a long time is very helpful. Another factor is the freemium model. So in 2009, MailChimp launched a forever free plan that would basically keep MailChimp free to all customers up until a certain number of marketing contacts. That helped MailChimp grow incredibly fast, not just in the US, but everywhere around. And at the bottom of every uh, free email newsletter that would go out, I'm um, sure you all have noticed, there's, there's this little MailChimp badge with a, with a Freddy, uh, you know, just there. And that was a great move by the team at the time, uh, including that discreet but noticeable Chimp logo at the bottom of every email. Uh, for free users. And so that I think helped really grow um, MailChimp like wildfire internationally. But there are two, I think the two most important pieces that I think um, have helped grow is number one, the brand. 
So super unique, playful, relatable brand. Also the reason I wanted to join MailChimp uh, just was always just so intrigued and just wanting to be part of that team. And we don't take ourselves too seriously. We try to inject fun in everything that we do. And I think that has resonated very well with customers around the world. And then finally, uh, our service partner network. So as I mentioned earlier, those freelancers, agencies, and developers who use MailChimp on behalf of their clients. In many ways, we consider to them to be the literal and figurative translators of our brand and products. So they are the ones that know the local markets, the customers, the product, and the brand better than anyone in their region. And that's a really strong combination. And we've been inve investing and in growing and empowering and nurturing that community to help them succeed. I'm going to pause. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, so you, you touched on something that I'm really curious about, which is um, the playful nature of MailChimp and you know the little chimp logo at the bottom that you noted um, as being really strategic and, and working really well. Um, it seems to me that it's very sort of US centric or American centric in its humor. Um, so I wonder like, how does that translate cross-culturally or how, how do you find customers, you know, say in Brazil or, um, or, you know, I don't know, Thailand, like how, how do other cultures interact with MailChimp and how does that translate or what is the strategy to, so that it will translate? So, yeah, I think so that brand aspect is one of, so as we think about international growth strategy, I think we always, companies have to think about what is going to travel well and what do we want to keep? And then what are the aspects that we want to change? What are the aspects that we want to adapt for the local uh, markets and customers? I think that's something that generally we want to keep, that playfulness, that uh, accessibility. Um, and so I think that has worked very well. Um, now our marketing, um, I think there is also a huge opportunity to adapt more of our marketing and some of our go-to-market efforts to, to be even more relevant, right? And add even more value to customers, no matter where they are, no matter what language they speak. So recently we launched a full marketing campaign in the UK, and we've also been ramping up other, other efforts to, 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 you know, to be, to ensure that we are able to communicate with, engage with, and connect with customers in a way that feels um, most relevant for them. Right. So you mentioned the UK, where you've got um, a, a large presence, and you also had mentioned Canada as well, and um, other parts, uh, other countries within Europe. Um, tell me, what are some of your markets that you're really focusing on right now in terms of the expansion strategy? Uh, I'm curious. Um, you know, parts of Asia is, are we looking at Latin America? And, and in the same question, I wonder if you could talk about, you know, some of the, some countries, it's very mobile phone oriented in everything they do. So when you were talking about email, you know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about my friends that I constantly talk to on WhatsApp, um, who are abroad. And it seems like that's their motive. So if it's an email marketing platform, how does that translate? So lots of questions there. You can attack any of them. <laughs> all right. Uh, no, all good questions. Um, so yes, definitely. In a, we have these, all of these factors, right, that have led to this international success. Now we have this huge opportunity. How do we build on momentum and how do we adapt our approach? So all of those countries that are mentioned, are definitely we've seen a ton of very early organic growth, um, but really we've seen we've seen growth all around, right? Um, whether it's Europe, Latin America, Asia, Africa, I think like many many SaaS companies, um, Europe tend to be tends to be where we had some of the earlier traction, um, and our approach in terms of figuring out where do we focus on next is really to to focus on the customers and listen to them. So. With over half of our business driven by markets outside of the US, we're in a position where it makes sense for us to follow demand uh, in our customers and essentially add uh, fuel to that, to that fire. What do you feel like is the, um, is the biggest challenge that MailChimp faces or that you personally face at MailChimp? 
in this role? <sighs> too many things I want to do, too little time. I would say in the same, you know, for international growth, I think um, it's a process and there is just, it's so deeply inherently cross-functional. We want to look at the entire experience end to end, right? From when we market to customers to when we engage, you know, when they land in our products to when we engage with them and we we focus on um, customer success and we want to make sure that we we support them and we we help them grow with MailChimp. And so we really want to look at the entire customer experience and say, what are the things that we can do to make customers' experiences even more relevant and valuable to help them grow? And so that's, I think the challenge is that, um, well, localization is at the core of our strategy to help attract, retain, um, and help customers grow. We can't do, we can't localize the entire, the entire customer experience and everything we want to do overnight. So I think the biggest challenge that I see, at least for me within my day-to-day my -day work, is that it's a process and we have to really prioritize uh, based on impact for the customers and also um, feasibility and, and, and timing on our end. Okay, thank you. Thank you for those thoughtful responses, Maureen. I appreciate it. Why don't we open it up um, to q and I know we've got a lot of folks here uh, in the audience who have a lot of, um, who have questions and have experience um, perhaps within the sector. So if you want to ask a question, um, as Ricky had noted, you can, um, you can do a couple of things. You can raise your hand virtually and I will see it. I see under reactions, you can go there and raise your hand. Um, and then I can call on you. You can unmute yourself and, um, and go on camera if you'd like and ask Maureen your question yourself, or you can add something in the chat. Or I don't see the Q&A function though that Ricky was talking about. So it, we'll do it those two ways. Okay, while, we'll, while we're waiting, let's see, do you have any questions? Uh, yeah, while we're waiting for you all to think of your really good questions. Oh, wait, we've got a couple. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. Nozomi Morgan, please. Yes. Hi. Thank you so much for taking my question. And thank you, Maureen, for um, for sharing. It's really exciting to see. I, I, I remember back in the days um, I, I started using MailChimp. Um, and it's just so excited to see the, the amazing growth of the company. So um, thank you for that. So my question is around um, people. So you mentioned, um, you know, with, the, with the, the fast growth that you have, I can only imagine, um, you know, managing people in different offices, different markets. Um, I just was curious, um, what kind of challenges do you face? Is there something specific different from Europe and Asia and uh, other places? Um, yeah, that, that would, I would love to hear from the people side. So definitely, I think the, the pandemic, right, changed things for everyone where everyone, um, went online and on zoom. I think for us, um, there were some, some, some learnings that we had to, to do there, but, um, I think we were already pretty comfortable working, uh, online, working on zoom, um, working async and so we have um i think the same challenges as everyone has you know when you're working with different uh service partners or different teams that are in different time zones and local markets um we 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 try to adapt and i, I think the fact that um, mailchimp is a tech company and we're kind of so comfortable working with technology makes it a little bit easier but we also have those 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 same challenges with time zones and cultural differences and, and, and all of that. So I don't know that I've answered your question, but uh, we haven't necessarily, um, you know, mastered it, but I think it's been, um, it's something that comes pretty naturally to the teams that we work with. Great, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that great question. Um, we've got another one from Charles. Hi, um, I've got a bunch of questions, but I'm, I'll ask one. Uh, your headquarters is a neighbor to me. I mean, what happens post acquisition? I mean, first of all, it seems terrible timing to be building these two gigantic buildings and then get 
when everybody decides they're going to work from home. So, you know, are the, do, you, do you still need those buildings? Are you guys going to keep them? You're going to sell them? Or are, you, are you staying there? Or what, what, what's going to happen with all that? We're definitely staying there. So um, we're, you know, I think the flexibility is a good thing. But definitely one of the things that we're hearing from, you know, from our colleagues and uh, leadership across the company is that just a lot of magic happens when you get together in person and you allow people to be creative. And so we're, that this hybrid, hybrid model is what, is what we're going after. We're going to give people more flexibility to come into the office as they need, but also work remotely. And so that's, uh, we, you know, we've been very recently acquired by, by Intuit and um, that is their philosophy as well. And I think they're, they're pretty excited as well to be, um, to be coming to Atlanta because it's a, it's a great place to be, great place to work. And there's a lot of, of really great talent here. And I think a lot of us do also miss being in the office because um, it's, a, it's a pretty special place. Can I ask another question, Amanda? Sure. I, I, Go for I apologize. It. This is about corporate culture. I mean, when two companies merge, when you have an acquisition, acquisition, I mean, that's often a huge pitfall, right? I mean, companies that aren't quite in sync with each other. I know it's still early on, but how, how what steps are you taking to avoid that? Um, how are you in the Intuit people, you know, meshing what you do with what they do. And then second to that, I don't know, you don't have to answer this, but how, I mean, I can't imagine more un-Coca-Cola company than MailChimp. So, I mean, you must've been, you know, struck by the uh, corporate culture when, when, when you shifted from Coke to MailChimp and I'll stop there. Thanks, Charles, for the for the questions. I'll start with the last question. Um, it's funny because when I was at Coke, I was part of a very startup like team, and we were actually, funnily enough, doing a lot of the things that are very similar to what Mailchimp does. Uh, the team that I was working with, we were building a, a marketing platform to basically empower small businesses and, and Coke associates and the system all around the world. And we were, yeah, we considered ourselves a startup. It was all focused on tech. You know, there was that marketing component. And I remember we were looking at, saying, oh, what are those people doing over there at MailChimp? Let's you know, love, you know, love the voice and tone, love the ease of use. So we were actually using MailChimp very often as an example for what we wanted to do with our uh, marketing platform, the startup within the Coke system. And so I, um, yeah, for me, it was always a company and a brand that I very much uh, admired. And so I, I really enjoyed um, just kind of joining that's, you know, that's more startup-like environment because that's the kind of thing that I like. And then your first question in terms of Intuit, it's a similar thing. I mean, MailChimp, very passionate about empowering the underdogs. Uh, serving small and medium-sized businesses, that's, that's in our DNA. And as, we, you know, as I've learned more about Intuit, it's become very clear that they share that mission in empowering small businesses and helping them win. So I see this acquisition of uh, MailChimp as the next phase of growth. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to build on momentum. Um, they have a lot of resources and infrastructure and things that are gonna help us essentially take things to the next level. Great, thank you. Thanks for the questions, Charles. Um, again, if you have a question, you can go to the reaction at the bottom and raise your hand and I'll be able to see you and call on you. So I wonder, Maureen, I wanna ask you, um, since you know you really operate in the, in, or you know, your client base operates in this virtual world, but they also operate in the physical world too. And I wonder what kinds of political economic risks in the world impact your clients, which then in turn impact you. And I don't know if that's something that, um, that you can address or um, how it pertains to your global expansion strategy. Oh, that's a definitely a factor to consider. So one of the things that we, continuously focus on is making sure that MailChimp works right for, for everyone. 
And so I don't know what, if you have in, something in mind specifically, but the first thing that comes to my mind is, for example, uh, local privacy and security regulations. Like you see the GDPR uh, in Europe. And so we just continuously always wanna make sure that we, not only are we compliant, right? And enable customers and users to use MailChimp in their local markets, but we also wanna essentially practice what we preach and say, okay, how do we make it easier for our customers um, to do the same because if you know if we're having to take some steps to make sure that Nelchimp is compliant no matter where you are whether you're in Brazil and you've got the LGPD or whether in Europe and you've got the GDPR all of those local regulations we want to make it easier for our customers to do the same and so those are the kinds of things that that we constantly have to be thinking about and make sure that we're on top of. Great, thank you. We have a question from Ramesh. Ramesh. Hi, Amanda. Hi, Hi Maureen. Hi, um, Ramesh. I had uh, stepped out for a few minutes. I don't know if this has already been talked about, but one of the questions I had, Maureen, is now that in, you're sort of part of Intuit, how do you see the international growth plans change, or more importantly, the strategy? Because you know you have obviously different kinds of resources and a different approach. What in in any way do you see the strategy for future growth from an international perspective evolve with the into that yeah good question i certainly think it gives us more opportunities so you know there are there are many i think many reasons why intuit was interested in mailchimp but i think the mailchimp's international footprint as well as um the really strong brand internationally yeah. were two factors and I think that uh, there's just going to be a ton of opportunity to to really um, to to partner up, right, and to and to offer even more value for customers, and to and to leverage some of the capabilities that Intuit has has built over the years. Got it. Okay. Thanks. How much, Marine? How much does uh, Mailchimp? How focused is Mailchimp on? Cybersecurity issues. Yeah, that's that's hugely important uh, for you know for for a, a tech company, a, a marketing platform. So definitely something that we we're on top of. Does that factor into expansion? I mean, do, do you feel like you're more or less vulnerable depending on your presence globally, or does that is that not an issue? I mean, I think that's something that we always have to be thinking about. I'm probably not the best person to ask about, you know, how that's evolved over time. I just, I just know that it's something that um, we take a lot of pride in, is in making sure that we uh, that we do everything, everything that we can. And so I think um, the as we grow, as we grow, probably the the, the challenges are constantly evolving, um, but not something that um, we're necessarily concerned about um, any any more or less, I think, than, than ever. It just continues to be something that's important to us. Right. Um, okay, that, I mean, that makes sense. I, I think that, you know, really location doesn't necessarily matter so much um, when you're talking about um, cyber security. Um, we're all targets in some way or another. We've been a very global platform for a long time. So yeah, just a matter mm -hmm. of scale. Yeah. Right. Right. So I'm going to go ahead. I know, I know someone out there wants to know the answer to this, so I'll go ahead and ask it for them. But so tell me about your competitors. Who do you see as your top competitors, um, either, you know, on a global scale or locally, or, you know, what, who is it that you've, you all look to and and you know what keeps Mailchimp up at night. I think that really depends what you're looking at because you know, Mailchimp started as as, a, as an email marketing tool. That was the strength. And so at the time, I remember that there were different different competitors that were focusing on email. As we started to add marketing channels, that starts to get more complex because you have all kinds of different different brands offering um, different. Um, capabilities for their customers. So I'll take one example, uh, Typeform. Uh, they're based in Spain and they offer a great way to, to, to create forms. 
and we even have an integration with them, right, to help um, if MailChimp customers want to use Typeform, they can integrate with that product and they can use it to grow their audience. Now, there is some overlap because MailChimp offers easy to use forms as well. But so that's one example of a competitor just focused on, you know, where we have some overlap over certain channels. Then you've got the, the global um, platforms. And so a company like HubSpot, for example, they have a lot of, they offer a lot of uh, similar services to their customers, although they might focus on a little bit of a different customer profile. So it really depends whether you're looking at the platform overall or certain channels, and then there are some local competitors as well. So those local competitors, or um, what is the name of the one in Spain again? You said type type form type form. They, okay, so so a platform like that that you have a lot of synergy with is that the kind of thing that you know would Mailchimp then acquire? Um, a, a platform like that? Does it make sense to? Is that part of the business model that then you would, um, you know, tack on and acquire smaller platforms and bring them into the MailChimp fold? Well, what I can share is that we have in the past, right, there have been some capabilities offered by, by, by great companies that we have, that we have acquired. So some e-commerce capabilities and more. So I don't know if it's, you know, what's on the table next. I can't speak to that, but um, no, I will say that we've, we've done it, <laughs> that we've, we've, we've done it before to, to help, um, to help build some of our marketing platform capabilities. Right. Great. Um, let's see. I'm making sure I'm not missing anybody. Um, any other questions out there? Uh, yes, Laura. Hey, Maureen, you mentioned GDPR compliance. And before I joined the council, I worked at a startup and I was on the team that worked to establish the GDPR compliance. And it goes without saying it was a journey. So my question is, do you have any advice or best practices to share on how to establish GDPR compliance? Well, hi, Laura. So first of all, I want to say that I can so relate because this was 2017, right? 2018, we were all, I was also part of the team that was helping prepare MailChimp for that. And then also preparing, helping prepare customers. We have some actually pretty great resources uh, that we put together, um, you know, at that time and that we've been building ever since to help um, startups and you know, growing businesses. Um, understand what those regulations mean and what they do and understand how they can leverage MailChimp to make it easier to comply. Uh, the webpage is MailChimp slash GDPR. And so you can find a lot of great information on that there. But I, I feel you, I know we were, I was right there with you, uh, part of that team trying to figure that out. That's good to know, thank you so much. Great, thank you. Okay, any other questions? I know you all have questions. Hmm? Let's see, make sure I'm not missing anybody. Scrolling through, okay. Well, Maureen, what's next at MailChimp? What's next on your, like what does your day, day look like and what's next for you? Um, at least what can you tell us about? Yeah, what something just that we're very focused on how do we make the experience and how do we add even more value for those customers that are that are that are using MailChimp and those customers that are not yet using MailChimp internationally. So um, we're focused on the end-to-end -end experience. So I think, you know, you mentioned about marketing, there are definitely some opportunities for us to, to start to be even more intentional about how we communicate, engage, connect with customers, but we also want to make sure that we do it also on the, the customer success end of things, the customer support. We want to make sure that we continue to provide um, resources as much as we can that are going to make things easier for those customers, no matter where they are. Uh, and so what's, you know, what's ahead for us is just working very closely with um, all the different teams across MailChimp that also touch, you know, that customer experience and just working with them to prioritize efforts. So what are the things that we should do first, right? Or next, 
um, to and that are going to drive the, the biggest impact. Um, because, like I said earlier, we, we can't do everything overnight, uh, and it's a process, and we have to kind of take it one, one step at a time. But um, definitely want to keep building on that momentum because it's a, it's a super exciting time. That's great. We have um, we have a question from Kate Powers, and then another question from Charles. And then we'll probably be up against time soon. So Kate, you wanna unmute yourself? Hi, I'm a member of the Young Leaders Tribe and I um, I wanted to chip in with a question that is, forgive me, slightly off topic, but I'm interested in how MailChimp has dealt with talent in the last year and specifically what you look for when you're looking for new talent. Well, um, definitely, you know, MailChimp, a lot of creatives at MailChimp. Um, so we always look for people who are able to, to come in and solve problems. And I think adaptability is very important. Um, MailChimp is constantly evolving, constantly growing. So being able to, um, to evolve, right? And, and, and adapt as the company grows. But really we want people that we, that that are going to help make it a, a great place, continue to make it a great place to work. So um, people who are going to be thoughtful uh, and also respectful of their colleagues and that that uh, are going to add an interesting perspective, um, whether it's, you know, thinking about customers around the world or making sure that we that we are representing our, our you know, different businesses, no matter um, where they are um or yeah so i don't know if I, that answers your question but and it really depends on 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 the team right we're we're always growing always looking for people and i think um it's just important to bring in people who can help us solve those big problems but work really well with all the different teams thank we you so much for that Thanks, Kate. Maureen, how many how many people are at Mailchimp here in Atlanta? In Atlanta, if I don't you were know, all I know. in the office at the same time. <laughs> That's a good question. I know the bulk. I mean, we have a lot of people in Atlanta. We have about twelve hundred uh, employees um, total. I don't know about the percentage in Atlanta, but I do know that when I joined six years ago, we were just we hadn't hit that five hundred milestone yet. So it's certainly grown in that time. Wow, yes, that's a that's quite a bit of growth. Great. Charles, I see your hand. I do. And this is more of an invitation than a question. And that is pre-pandemic, uh, MailChimp was a corporate member of the World Affairs Council of Atlanta. And um, I would like to, on behalf of all the members, invite MailChimp to rejoin. It would be great for you to be an advocate within MailChimp slash Intuit. For y'all to think... rejoin, that would be terrific. Because, because it's funny, because at the time, um, that, that, you, you, yeah, let me just put the other way around. Your international business has grown so much since then that it seems like it was, it, you're even a better fit now than, you, than we are a better fit for you than, than we were two years ago. Well, that is a lovely invitation. And I think that that would be wonderful. Um, yeah, I would love for, for MailChimp to, to join uh, and to be part of it. And so I will work with whoever I need to, to see what we can do and make that happen. And actually I was just before this call was happening, I said to Amanda, I would love, what do I need to do to join these calls moving forward? So I will take that as an invitation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Charles, for the pitch, for sure. Um, the more the more folks that we have um, from Mailchimp involved with the World Affairs Council, the better, as far as I, I can see. I think that there are lots of um, there are many members at the council who have an interest in tech, an interest in international growth, international business, marketing. So uh, I think there's a lot that we can learn from you all. And um, not versa. just tonight, but you know, going forward. Um, especially when we're all back um, more regularly in person, I think um, we all gain a lot of perspective from one another when we're in the room together. So um, yes, I hope you'll take Charles up on his invitation and you, you will join. Um,
Um, let's see, do we have any other questions? Last questions before we wrap this up. Um, I don't see any. Every, we have some shy folks tonight, but um, but we've covered a lot of ground and I'm really excited to have heard um, your story, Maureen, and your personal background and the story of MailChimp and where Mail MailChimp is going in its international organic growth um, expansion strategy, I think is really exciting. And I can't wait to keep up with you and to keep up with MailChimp and, and hear what happens next. Um, Cause I know that it's gonna be great things. And I think it's really great for Atlanta that you all are here. Um, so with that, I'm thank you very much. Thank you all for joining. I'm not sure if Ricky was gonna come back on to, to say. Um, I'm here. Yeah, there she is. All right. Hello. Well, thank you again, Maureen. We appreciate it. And over to you, Ricky. Maureen, thank you so much. I, you know, of course, I've, as a member of the media for 15 years, I literally followed MailChimp's rise um, on, li on live broadcasts, actually reported on it as we went. Uh, so it's really interesting to get actually an insider's perspective, which I had never gotten before. So thank you for joining us. Um, and I echo Charles's um, shout out to joining uh, for having MailChimp join the council as a corporate sponsor. Maureen, I've already messaged you on LinkedIn about how to become an individual member. And that is an invitation for everybody on this call. You can find information about becoming a member of the World Affairs Council of Atlanta at our website, wacatlanta.org, wacatlanta.org. And as a member, you get exclusive invitations to meet people like Maureen, who Starting in March, we're going to be having in-person events. Applause. Uh, okay, applause. Well done, Amanda. So we would love to have you come on as a member at any level. We have multiple membership levels. And also at our website, you can sign up for our bi-weekly newsletter to learn about events. We've got some great things coming up. Here's a preview. Just this coming Thursday, February 24th, we are hosting a President's Breakfast exclusively for our Chairman Circle Preferred and corporate members, please reach out to us if you'd like information about attending this week. Friday, March 4th, that's next week. Yes, we're at March. Join us in person with the Estonian ambassador to the U.S., Christian Prick. This is a breakfast event in Midtown at Smith Gambrell, the beautiful law firm. They just built a gorgeous new building uh, right on in Midtown, and we're going to be meeting with the ambassador, and his comments are going to be so timely because of what's happening with Russia right now. Estonia is no stranger to Russian aggression. Um, and then, of course, Tuesday, March 8th, International Women's Day. Join us for an inspiring virtual conversation with our keynote speaker, Jamil Bichio. She is Senior Coordinator for Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment at USAID. She's doing incredible incredible work all around the world on, world on behalf of women and girls. That is a day where we're going to spend all day talking about women and girls. So please join us. And um, thank you for joining tonight. I'd like to thank our behind the scenes team, our graduate students, Anna Petrova of the Andrew Young School of Policy Studies and Laura Brower from the Robinson College of Business. We look forward to seeing all of you at our next World Affairs Council Members Forum event. Thank you, Amanda, for wonderful moderation. Thank you, Maureen, for offering your insights. Thanks to all of you for your questions, and we'll see you next time. If I may, thank you so much for having me. This was wonderful. <clears throat> it's an honor to be here, and uh, we will be in touch. Sounds great. Great. Thanks we've, so much, we've made Maureen. you emotional, Maureen. We have that effect on people. <laughs> Sorry, I need, I have some tea. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. Thank you, Maureen. And thank you, Ricky. This is great. And thank you all to the members. It's an awesome night. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.